Welcome back to Celebrity Radio. It's Alex Belfield talking to some of the country's biggest stars and some of my favourite people. And we've got one for you today. A lady who's been evergreen on our TVs for over, well, let's say 10 years, because 20 or 30 might get embarrassing. Cheryl Baker is one of our biggest personalities and the star of Bucks Fizz. They're back on tour from September. I'm delighted to say she joins us on the phone now. How are you? I'm all right. Thank you. It must be good to be you because you're one of those faces we're always pleased to see. You've never sort of had that thing where you've gone out of popularity or out of fame. You've always been there. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, you can't get rid of me. <laughs> I, I love it, though. I love my life. I love what I do. I love singing. I love the TV presenting. So, yes, I've been very, very lucky in that respect because, you know, my career has taken me through different routes and, and I've had different... Um, groups of people that have followed me because of the route that I took, you know. So some people are Fizz fans, some are Record Breakers fans, and some, you know, I work on cruise ships, some have, you know, just seen me on a cruise ship. And I suppose it's because I've put myself about a bit, really. <laughs> you have been around the houses, haven't you? I hope you <laughs> I hope you haven't stopped in most of them. I suppose the thing about you is I wonder, are you fundamentally a presenter or a singer? Because they're the two things you do very well. Fundamentally a singer. Right. The um, Fundamentally, like, as in, it's my life. The other stuff is my job. I, I, I present television programmes or I guest on television programmes because it pays a wage. Singing is something that I just wanted to do from as far back as I can remember. Um, and so that, it's almost like being paid for my hobby. Right. So it's, it, it's absolutely my life. I, can't, I couldn't live without music. Did you have a life out of show business before it? Because it seems I can't find a lot prior to Bucks Fizz and you're becoming a television presenter. Um, I was in another band before Bucks Fizz and we did the Eurovision in 1978. So I joined them in 1975. Um, but before that, because I am 193 years old, <laughs> before I was in Coco, as they were called, um, I was a shorthand typist in the city in London. So I, you know, took dictation, typed letters, answered phones, that sort of thing, for five years. From leaving school for five years, um, I left school at 16 and worked for five years and then um, joined my first band. I guess for you, the great thing is that you've been around so long, you've worked with everybody. And we look at some of the names from Cliff Richard to the Nolans to all of those people you performed and worked with. Were there moments when you pinched yourself and thought, actually, this is getting crazy now? Yeah. There were, there were times. There were times when when you'd be standing in a conversation next to Paul McCartney. Wow. And he'd squeeze your hand as if to say, it's all right, because I was, you know, this was the early days of Bucks Fizz, so I was really nervous of meeting people. And he squeezed my hand as if to say, it's okay, it's okay. And being introduced to Stevie Wonder, because he was on the same record label as us, and he'd gone straight to number one with, I just called to say I love you. And... Um, I, I can't remember, I think I was there because I was in Bucks or so it might have been because I was doing record breakers. Yeah. I can't remember that. But being introduced to him and thinking, hang on, I should be cleaning his shoes. I shouldn't just be shaking his hand. It's ridiculous. Um, and royalty and, you know, there's just people that you meet that you think, oh, I can't believe... Uh, and do you know what? Someone I wasn't introduced to but I saw on a, an easy jet flight was David Attenborough mm. and we we got off the, off the plane and I saw him and I had ran up to him and I said, you don't know me, I said, I've just got to say thank you for all the years, decades of happiness that you've given to us all and I just had to do it. Oh, lovely, <laughs> um, yeah, you're So, yeah, right. there's people I've met, not necessarily through the business, <laughs> just because I've played them. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? Those moments where you're not expecting to see people can be the most surprising. Well, I, I just thought, I, I have to say this because he's phenomenal. So rather than go, oh, look, there's David Attenborough, I thought, no, 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 just let him know. I'm sure he does know, but just let him know what we think of him and how much we love him. Mm. For me, I'm 36 now. I grew up watching you, as you mentioned earlier, on Record Breakers, which I just thought was a wonderful show and really something they should bring back because it was wholesome, it was entertaining, and it was brilliant. Of course, it was held together by you and Roy Castle, probably one of the greatest entertainers of his generation. Yeah, he was, he was. And it was, um, it was, I did it for 11 series. Um, it was a fantastic series to be on. I loved it. And I, I especially loved the filming, not so much in the studio, because in the studio, you know, it's stop, start, stop, start, takes forever. 
But when you're out and you're actually seeing people breaking the records, that was phenomenal. And Roy and I went on one trip one year from the east coast of America across to the west coast of America watching people break records. And we were we were away for over a fortnight and uh, it was just, just great. It, it was so lucky to, to do stuff like that and to work with, as you say, someone that's an absolute legend as, uh, as Roy Castle. It's such a shame because he died... He actually died um, almost 22 years ago now because he came to see me when uh, I had my children. Mm. And my children were born on the 20th of June. Wow. And he died very shortly after that. So I know he's been, he's been dead that long. Um, and so, so these generations uh, since then haven't grown up with him. And I, and I think that's such a shame because he was phenomenal, wasn't he? Such yeah. a great man. And everyone says to me, was he as nice as he came across? And he really was. He was so lovely. He was such a kind man. He always had time for you. You were never, rather, he was never the important one you were, even though, of course, he was far more important than anyone I'd ever met. You know, he'd played on, uh, in Broadway and been in movies and done so much and broken so many records. He was so, such a phenomenal talent, and yet he made you feel like you were the important one. Yeah, that common touch, you can't buy that, can you? No, you can't, no, it's true. What I love about your career too, and we're going to end by talking about Eurovision, which of course was your defining moment, but I love the fact you've always remained classy and done good stuff. You've never opted to do the sort of celebrity big brother stuff. Is that intentional or do you just not want to do it? Oh, listen, mate, I've done some really really dodgy stuff. (laughs) Really dodgy. (laughs) Stuff that I really regret. I kissed once, my, my manager said, oh, Cheryl, you need some higher profile. And so I did a, a world record-breaking kiss with Giles Brandreth. Oh, good Lord. And he burped in my mouth. He, he, and he just had a cup of coffee and he burped. It was, oh. You know, there's some things that you really shouldn't do, and that's one of them. And, and, the, and the other thing I had done, which was really stupid of me, and again, it was because I was told you, your profile's going down, you need to do get some telly. It was when the um, the salon was on telly. I had colonic irrigation. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Do you know what? They offered me a pedicure, hairdo, manicure, facial. But I thought, oh, colonic irrigation, that's, that's supposed to be really good for you. I'll try that. I didn't think of the implications that it was going to be on television. So, yeah, no, there are some dodgy things I've done. But I would not do Celebrity Big Brother. I, I've, I made uh, a stand. There's certain... Certain things that I can't do, like the jump, um, but I can't do it because I'm not good skier, and I won't do like as in Big Brother because I think it's um, demeaning, demoralising, brings out the worst in you. It makes you do things and say things that you wouldn't normally do and say, so you come across as the bitch from hell or something. Mm. You know, it's just it's not good. And I'm very much for the common man. If I see someone being bullied, then I go and stand up for them, and then I end up with the with with the um, in the argument and I can see things like that happening with me so so I yeah me too they, they often write to me and say will you do come dine with me and I say no because you're going to have me sat in a room for six hours and use the 22 seconds when I call somebody a prat and walk out yeah that's it yeah <laughs> yeah you know how it works. Too risky. Um, and then we look at Eurovision, and it's never been more popular than it is now, but back in the day, it still had a tremendous audience. I'm always curious how people like you keep your nerve, because at that moment when you're globally broadcast, you must just want to sink in the ground in a way, because you know all the right eyes are on you, and if you get it wrong, everybody's going to see it. It's incredibly nerve-wracking. It really is. Um, and you just you have to look at the audience. See, the thing is, now, the audience is vast because they, they, they perform in arenas. When we did it, it was more like theatres or studios. Yeah. It, and, and, you know, you had all these stuffed shirts sitting watching you with polite applause. So it was very different than it is now. Now I think it's fantastic. I was over there this year in Sweden um, for the run-up to it because I was presenting for um, um, Good Morning Britain, is it called? Yeah. Yeah. GMB, yeah. Um, and so now you've got all the flag waving fans that really, and they and they wave their flags no matter who's singing. It's not like the football, you know. It's you, you actually are cheering every country on because you're cheering on the fact that it's a great show, not that you want one performer to win. Although you do, you support your own country. But you, it's one of those occasions where there's nothing but goodwill 
involved. There's no animosity, there's no booing. Just It's just a feel-good thing, you know. It's, it's, it wasn't like that when I did it before. But I, th- I do think it's incredibly nerve-wracking, incredibly nerve-wracking. The, the, the fact that we all wear in-ears now, you know those in-ear monitors yes. that we all wear now, um, that rules out a lot of external sound which is great because you feel like you're on you in your own world and then and you can actually properly hear your voice as opposed to listening to it through floor monitors where you're getting the sound of your voice and the track or the orchestra but you're also getting lots of external noise and applause and you know you can hear lots of other stuff when you've got those in ears in um you're in your own vocal world and you're in more control and i think that's made a huge improvement to the the caliber of the singing it has for us please when we're on stage it's uh, it's really improved it trying to trying to trying to balance four vocals in monitors across the stage where you've got so much other noise going on and a band behind you you know with the drums blaring out yeah. you know when you've got those little in ears in that's fantastic because you just you can have exactly what you want you've got your own tiny little monitor like like when you're listening to your ipod or you you know yeah so um yeah, so I, I think that the Eurovision is bigger and better than ever before. Still, still controversial, still political. You know, it's always been political, and it always will be. But, but it's still the biggest and the best musical extravaganza of the entire year. Well, and again, it might be camp old nonsense, but we all get behind it. We know what it is. And Terry, I think, was a lot to do with that. I'm sure for you it was a great shot when he passed. So surprising because none of us knew anything about it. No, I know, that was a shock, wasn't it? And bless his heart, Graham has done a, a great job and people now, young people now, only think of Eurovision as Graham. But once again, going back to the Roy Castle situation, Terry, was he was King Eurovision, wasn't he? Oh, he was. I mean, even countries abroad, people in Holland, they would listen to our broadcast rather than theirs because it was so much more entertaining yeah. because of Terry. I loved it when he'd had a little drink. I remember one day he uh, he looked out at whoever it was on stage and he said, I don't know their name, but they've got a mouth full of teeth. And I thought there's no better introduction than that, is there? <laughs> a legend. We talk about the, the 80s and then we move forward to 2016. And here you are bringing these songs back to life, making your mind up. And of course, uh, Land of Make Believe, which is one of my favourite songs that you ever did. What is it like standing on the stage today bringing these songs back to life, it must be thrilling that people still care. Um, it's possibly better than it was then, because then, back in the 80s, our audience were aged 9 to 13, and they were being brought there by their parents. And they did scream. I mean, they were a screaming audience. But now, they are adults in their late 30s with their own children. They still come with their parents. So the grandparents are there, the parents are there, and the children are there. Um, so we have we have three um, uh, completely different age groups uh, who all have been raised on Bucks Fizz um, because a Bucks Fizz fan plays Bucks Fizz to their children. That's for sure. That's for sure. And so the children are raised as Bucks Fizz fans, yeah. even though we were, you know, 35 years on. Um, and it's lovely. It's just wonderful. There's a huge cheer. When we have a film that starts our show showing um, clips of all the singles and the number ones and the top tens, and, and then it shows shots of us with our name, and a cheer goes up when every name goes up. And then we run on stage, and, you know, it, it's, just, it's just wonderful. I, I cannot wipe the smile off my face from the beginning of going on stage to the end. I just, I love it. I love it so much. And it's still utterly thrilling. Is it ever intimidating? Do you ever worry about, is the voice going to be there or is that stuff second nature now? No, 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 I don't. Um, once again, because we wear those in ears now, you don't tend to shout as much because you can hear. Sometimes you used to have to really strain your voice to yeah. make yourself heard because of all the external noise coming through the monitors and that, and you don't have to do that anymore. So basically the sound guy out the front has to balance the vocals as they are and if you're singing softly, you have to raise your vocal. That's, you know, it's, it works very well. No, the only time that I'm concerned about my voice is if I've had a cold or a cough, you know, and then it, then you suffer. Last year, I lost my voice completely. Yeah, can't so, do much about that. I, I was on tour as well, so they, they basically, I still do the show. 
Um, but I couldn't sing, so they had to manage without me. I just, I mouthed the words as best I could. And no, there's nothing you can do about it. It's just, um, just one of those things. Yeah. People, I guess, just want to see you, and that's the most important thing. The show must go on. Well, I would always, yeah. I mean, I'd have to, my leg would have to fall off for, for me not to appear. <laughs> Very finally, because of course you know everything about Europe because of the Eurovision Song Contest. What should I be voting this week? Because I've still no idea. I hear a lot of people screaming, and I'm... anyone really knows. Even 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 if you listen to the people who are saying, you know, stay in, go out. I don't think there's, there are pros and cons to both, and there are those of us who who knew Europe and knew the UK before we were in the common market, as it was called then. So um, I think that if you vote out eventually we'll be fine but initially we'll be hit and if you vote in i think that the same thing will happen that eventually we will be hit because we will be governed by europe um so we won't we won't be able to make our own rules and regs you know it, it will be it'll be like the united states it'll be the united states of europe and we'll just be one of the states mm. so um but if we vote out then as I just said, we will initially suffer. There's no no question about it. There will be sanctions and all sorts of things that, you know, that, that there'll be penalties to pay. So you have to think long term. What do you think? Don't think of it initially. Don't think of the next couple of years. Think of your children and your children's children. How you think a United States of Europe would work for them or an independence will work for them. Yeah, I hear a lot of people screaming, there seems to be two sides of it. I get Cameron's point that once we're out, we're out, we can't go back in. I also hear that... Why does he say that? Why does he... I, I heard him, and mm. I thought, why are you saying once we're out, we're out, we can't go back in? Well, who said that? Who said, no, you can't come back in? It's like playing a game. Yeah. It's like playing a game. Oh, no, no, do you say no? Well, that's it, you're out. You're not going, we're not going to let you back in again. That's nonsense. That's, that's fear tactics, and I hate that. I hate that. I hate the fact that they're trying to fool each other. And we're not fools. None of us are fools. And that's a stupid thing to say. Because if they want, they want us in, Europe wants us to be there because we're putting so much into the economy and we give, we give so much generally, not just with the economy. You know, we're a big player in Europe and they want us to be in it. They're scared that we're going to leave. So... If we, if we do leave, they're not going to say, well, that's it then, that's it, you've dug your own grave, you're not coming back in now, because we're not playing a game. Yeah. And I, don't, I hate those fear tactics, I hate them. It does seem to me, just interviewing people like yourself and talking around town, that the biggest thing is immigration. That's what people are most upset about, beyond the pound, beyond money, beyond any rules and regs from Europe. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's... We are... See, the thing is, we're a nation of immigrants. So I'm, I'm, I'm a, I understand, you know, that I, I'm not anti-immigration at all because, you know, I, I'm from um, Polish and Irish blood. So if it hadn't been for the UK welcoming my grandparents with open arms, I don't know what, you know, I don't know, where, where would I be? Um, so I'm not anti-immigration at all. But I am anti-spongers, um, and I don't want people just to come here because we have a welfare system. Mm. So if people can come here and work, or come here because they really are... Um, um, oh, God, come on, mate, what's the word? Refugees um, or... Refugees, need help. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you know, you see those children and families walking from Syria, like we did with um, Uganda, so many places. You know, they need a home, and so we, we are capable of giving them a home. But I don't want people just to come because they know they can go on the lump, as my mum used to say, get, you know, get, their, get their property paid for by hard-working people and get handouts. And that's, that's what we have to put a stop to. Yeah. Really lovely talking to you today. It's been uh, my absolute pleasure. Let's do the big plug then. Box Fizz are back on tour from September, Friday, 16th. Formerly of Box Fizz. We can't call ourselves Box Fizz. What is that then? So what are you? You're, you're formally Boxford. No, Cheryl, Mike and Jay, formerly of Boxford with Bobby McVeigh. So there's four of us on stage. Bobby McVeigh did the Eurovision in 1983 with a band called Sweet Dreams, came sixth. He's fabulous. We've known him since those days. He's always been a mate. And last year we said, you know what, we'd love it to go back to being a four again. And he lives in Italy. So he said, uh, he said, oh, at first he said, I can't, I live in Italy. And then he went, you know what, I really miss it. Let's, let's do it. So... He's now 
with us. We're back to being Cheryl, Mike, Jay and Bobby, but we can't be called Bucks Fizz because we don't own the trademark. Right. So we can say formerly Bucks Fizz will be back on tour from September 16th at the Red Hill in Surrey, going via Radlett and South End and Rotherham and South Shields. Uh, ending up in November in Clacton, Cannock. Uh, you're going to Horsham Crew, Epsom, Bury St Edmunds, and finishing on the 17th of November at Litchfield at the Garrick Theatre. Formerly a Bucks Fizz, Cheryl, Mike, Jay uh, will be together with Bobby McVeigh for this wonderful The Make Believe Tour. Great to talk to you. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you very much.